All right, Shalom, Shalom, everybody, Israel, Israel and Judah. Good to see you again. And uh, praise Yah for another Shabbat. All right, praise Yah that we all still in the land of the living. We still can grow and accumulate works for the kingdom that, that he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant to you on and to continue to learn and grow, because this is grace. We're living in a grace time, and this is what grace is all about. Well, in the times past of our lives, we've lived in such a way where we accumulated a lot of sin, a lot of judgment and, and uh, condemnation. But um, we have a chance now to accumulate work, good works of faith. Faith that our works is dead and to be, be obedient, to have a faith walk with Yah. We, we have that opportunity uh, to live uprightly, though it's not easy. Though it's not easy all the time, you know, a lot of people uh, have heard what their idea of, of, of the faith is, is that you receive Jesus and everything goes well after that. Uh, no, I beg to differ. You receive Yahweh and you walk with him, and you find your purpose. Find your purpose, and that doesn't mean everything goes well. That doesn't mean everything goes well. But if you're going and you're walking in the will of the one that you serve, then if you know what will is, that's well. No matter what happens, no matter what takes place, you're walking in his will. Everything as well. There's a song that I heard uh, a few people sing. The safest place in the whole wide world is in, is in the will of God. And even if that will sometimes turns out that you go through some suffering, uh, some hardships, some uh, some some health issues, and uh, even if that will means that you go through uh, rejection. Um, poverty, all right? Whatever that will, whatever that will takes you to, when you know that you're with Yah, all right? When you know that you're with him, that's all that really matters. Once you learn that, you, now you've learned a big secret of life. It's that it's not about just things going well. There's a word that we call happy. It's, it comes from the word happening, all right? And uh, that's an English word, and a lot of it means happy means you're doing good for what's happening. But if if you're not doing good for what's happening, you're not happy no more. All right. And uh, there's a word called joy that can kind of uh, that can kind of uh, put the shackles on on happy, on just being happy, 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 happy. Joy is having a fountain, a blessing in your heart, regardless of what's going on, all right? Regardless of what's going on, that's what joy is, all right? You don't have to be smiling to have joy, all right? Um, I used to think that when I first came into the faith, I used to think that you had to have your face shining and smile on your face and shaking hands with everybody and loving and hugging on folks. And you know, but I learned, I found out that that's not, that's not joy. All right, there's a scripture that says in Nehemiah, I think it says, "The joy of the Lord, the joy of Yahweh is our strength." All right, it didn't say the happiness. <laughs> Excuse me, it didn't say the happiness of Yahweh is our strength. What was that scripture? Uh, let's see, Ezra, Nehemiah. Let's try this. Nehemiah 8. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, but this day is holy unto, you, unto Adonai. Neither be ye sorry. Now, notice he's saying, neither be ye sorry, but he doesn't tell them to be happy. Watch this. 
is this is where it's sorry right here. All right, which might be somewhat close to being the opposite of happy. Need to be you sorry for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. The joy right here. All right. And once you learn this about joy, and all we still all everybody, even the most uh mature Christian or believer, I, I don't want to say Christian because I don't believe we're really Christians. We're Israelites, all right, that believe in the Messiah. But uh most believers, um, this is your strength, Joel. Let's look at this 2304 in Hebrew. Rejoicing, gladness, joy. I noticed it didn't say happiness. So you can, you can, there's some, you know, like me, I don't all the time smile and jump up and down with happiness, but I, I can be glad. All right. And it's really, this word joy right here is the key to all of that, all right? Joy can be in your heart while you're going through a lot of tribulations. Let's go to some more scriptures on this. Joy could be your strength. It can be what gets you through and the reason why you get the victory, all right? Let's go to James chapter one, let's see. James chapter one, verse two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. See that? What is this? Now, this is the Greek word for joy here. 54, 79, let's see what it says. Kara. Uh, it's in the Greek, kara. I think that's how you say it, kara or kara. 5479, cheerfulness that is calm delight. And I think that's a good word for joy, calm delight. Now when you jump up and down like you just won something on the Price is Right game show or, or uh, what is the other one? Game show, they come up and people win, they jumping all up and down the place. Uh, a calm delight, glad, there's that word glad, gladness. Times greatly be exceedingly joy. There's the word joy, joyfulness, joyous. All right. But this is what this is all about. So you don't have to be running around cheats and stuff all over the place uh, in order for you to be living out your faith. You could be just as calm and delightful. And no, nope. sometimes people see you like that. They see you happy. You have those those uh, predators out there <laughs> in the world that they say, "Oh, that person's happy." Let me go steal this happiness from him. I want that. Let me go get it from him real quick. You know, and that's how the world is too. They get jealous because they see you with a smile on your face. They want to, they want to turn that smile, that, that 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 smile upside down into a frown. All right. But it says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith work in patience. So what it is when you when you're going through, it's a trying. And that word trying in the Greek is 1383. But the trying of your faith work of patience. I see what that means. Dokomion, Dokomion, 1383, at testing. And uh, when we are in school as kids or adults in college or whatever, and all of a sudden the teacher comes out with a pop quiz, a pop test, a surprise test. And nobody really likes that because they may not have studied the way they should. Most people don't like it. They haven't really prepared. But it's a testing uh, by implication, trustworthiness. All right. The trying, trustworthiness, the trial. Trying. So, trial is a good way of looking at this. A trial, like you think of the court system. We're going through a trial. So a lot of this in our faith is about trials. You don't come into this faith without going through some trials. All right. Knowing this, that the trying or the trial of your faith, work in patience. All right. And the reason why Yahweh try you is because he loves you, because you, he sees you as he is. If he doesn't try you, if Yah doesn't try you, he doesn't see you as he is. 
All right, but let's go on. But let the, let patience have her perfect work. But let, so it's up to you. You can cut the trial off, but I'm gonna tell you this. Uh, if you cut it off, when you, when you finally say, let me get back with y'all. Y'all's gonna say, oh, you ready? Okay, let's go, let's continue. You're gonna start right at that same place you left off at. All right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it normally happens. I hate to say that. I don't want to discourage anybody. But when you get the when you get born again and you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I've been lately talking about this baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you got power to overcome no matter what comes against you. All right. The whole thing is about faith. The whole thing is about faith. And a lot of faith, a lot of our faith has something to do with patience. This word right here that I got highlighted, let patience have her perfect work. So your faith without patience, and patience is a fruit of the spirit. As a matter of fact, if you study the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of that, you know, those are fruits of the spirit. And faith is, is part of that fruit. But patience is a part of faith. There's no faith without patience. And if you can't wait on what God has for you, then you're gonna be waiting uh, for God to be able to use you. You'll be waiting on yourself, all right? To let God have, let God do what he wants to do in your life. And when we realize this, we're not our own, all right? We're not our own, we're bought with a price, all right? We're bought with a price, the blood of Yahweh Shabbat Shia. All right, we, we should let Yah have his way with our lives because he's gonna keep his law. He's not, a, he's not wicked. He's not the devil. Now, when Yah does take us through trying and trials, guess what? He might allow the devil to do some things, all right? He might allow Satan, the arch enemy of our souls to try some things on you. And usually Satan's gonna try you in the area where you're weak at spiritually. In the area where you're weak at, that's what he's gonna try. He's gonna come at you in that area. I'm reading the book of Job at the moment. And uh, the, very, the very thing that Yah allowed to happen to test Job is he allowed Satan to do some things. Remember, Yah is, is king in heaven over the evil angels as well as the good angels. So there's evil angels in heaven, there's good angels. And, you know, I'm not going to go into that topic today, but we should all know there's, there's, there's demons and devils up there in the spirit, and we have good angels, holy angels. And one of the major things he allowed to happen was he allowed the evil angel, Satan, to afflict Job, to bring about uh, an, uh, a good end, all right? So that's what happened with us, too. That's the why you want the baptism. And you want to pray about this. If you have never done this or you, you've not taken it serious, pray for the baptism, the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, I, we looked at that last week or a week before about the book of Acts chapter one, that the disciples, after Yahweh re, uh, resurrected and ascended into heaven, he told them before he, he ascended into heaven, he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the power to come upon them from on high. It was the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost, that power means dunamis in Greek. And it comes from the word dynamite or is affiliated with the word dynamite, his power. And we know that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So when we are weak, he is strong. That means that Holy Ghost is dynamite, is powerful. So you want to pray and ask God for the Holy Ghost. And even then, it's kind of testing. It's, it's going to try you. You know, God's going to put your whole person to the test. But that if it lasts, if this thing lasts forever and the reward is great, you know, that, that little light affliction that Yah allows to come up on us is nothing compared to the reward. So just consider that. But let's see James chapter one, verse four. But let patience have her perfect work. So patience, when you are walking with faith, and faith with Yah, if you let patience do its thing, it's going to be a perfect work in you. Hold on just a moment. All right, so patience, well, if you let it, 
that's the reason why I said let. That's the reason why that word right there is in front of patience. Let. This is up to you. All right. It's up to each and every one of us to allow Yah to do what he wants to do. All right. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I had to allow Yahweh, the Holy Ghost, to fill me, to come up on me. Because it's not, it's not normal. All right. It's not normal to allow the Holy Ghost to come up on you. Because you got this flesh, you got this flesh that fights against the spirit of Yah. There's two things in your system that, that's at war, the flesh and the spirit. They are at enmity, at odds with one another that you may not do the things you normally would do. But let's see, let, let patience have a perfect work. So when you let patience do its thing, when you're walking with Yah and just allow Yah to do its thing, it becomes a perfect work. That you may be perfect. See, that you may be what? Let's look at this word perfect, 50, Greek 50, 46. In the Greek, teleos, teleos, 5046, and it means complete. All right? It means complete. Let me highlight this. Complete. Do, do you want to be complete? You won't be complete not allowing Yah to do what he wants to do with your life. You will be incomplete. And you don't want to die or go on to your eternal reward being incomplete, not saying that you're gonna lose your soul, but you will suffer loss. Because you wanna be complete in various applications of labor, growth, mental and moral character. So that's what that means, teleos, it means complete in various applications of labor, growth, mental, and moral character. Uh, completeness of full age. So the whole purpose of our faith or so that we will in the end become full age. That means there's some people that are baby Christians. They are baby believers in the Yahweh Shai. I'm still using that word Christian, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are baby believers in Yahweh Shai and Mashiach, all right? And that's what we don't want. We don't wanna be a baby believer. You wanna reject that. You wanna pray and ask Yah for maturity. But when you ask Yah for maturity, guess what? Guess what you're going to get? The trying of your faith. That's up to you to let patience have a perfect word that you may be entire, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right? So you want to get to that point. All right? And I, I, I really believe this is what's going to cause the second coming. Okay? The second coming to happen. Is it going to be a group of people or just one person with a group of people that's going to get to this point? All right. What well, a perfect. The book of Genesis says that, uh, that Esau was a, was a man of the field, a, a cunning archer or hunter, or Jacob was a perfect man dwelling in tents. A lot of people say Jacob was really a conniver and all of that. But the Bible in the Hebrew is he uses perfect man dwelling in tents for Jacob. And he's the one that got the birthright in the end. He was the one that was forecasted to get the birthright, even though he was the younger son. All right. Well, you you want to be perfect. And this comes with testing and trial and tribulation. Perfect and entire. Let's look at this word entire right there. 3648 in the Greek. Uh, Hakloros. Hakloros. Hala chloros, hala all right, 3648 in the Greek, uh, complete in every part that is perfectly sound, entire whole. So your whole, your whole walk as a believer in Yahweh Shai is basically, it's, it's, it's kind of like a running a race or an athletic competition. The better, you want to get better and better at it, all right? You do have an enemy, you have a, we, we all have uh, an enmity, uh, adversary, all right? And when the adversary can't get you in the areas we used to get you, he'll go up higher. he go up to another level. Kind of like playing video games. When you get to this level, you, you ace it. You go to the next level, and right off the top, you're not that good at it because it's another level. But if you keep playing with it, 
you're going to get good. So with that other level, you're going to need another level to challenge you. Because that level that you used to be able to not be able to handle is a piece of cake for you. But this is what happens in this walk, this faith walk. So you may be entire, wanting nothing. All right. So, so it's, it's a faith walk. It's a faith test. All right. All right, so we started out like this as the spirit led me and started talking on these things about joy. And joy is what gets you through all of this. And what happens is when you're born again, you have joy. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to, be, to have joy. All right, you don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to have joy. You can just be born again. And there's a joy there that the world cannot give you. All right, and that's one of the first things that happens is there's a change that takes place in you when you get born again. What happens is, is that your joy now is in the one that saved you, the one that redeemed you, the one that died for you on the cross, the one that took all of that beating and that, and that did, that, oh my goodness. What he went through was really something else. He did all of that for you, for our sins. All right, he, he, what he did not deserve, he, he took upon himself. He lived a perfectly righteous life, but he took our sins upon himself. And this is what happens when that is revealed in your life, in your heart, that new birth, is you have a joy inside you. Why? Because your hope for life is now inside, is there. You, now you have eternal life, all right? Even if you don't realize it, your spirit man realizes and has joy. All right, so let me read this all again. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The whole thing is about temptations. 3986 in the Greek. Parismos, parasmos, are putting to proof by experiment of good, experience of evil, solicitation, discipline, or provocation, by implication, adversity, temptation. So how are you test it with temptations? Now, when Yahabashai was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and John saw the spirit like a dove landing upon him, and, and uh, Yahabashai came out of the water praying, and a dove came upon him, right? And immediately after he was baptized, and he heard the voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and everybody heard it. Some saying it was a sound like an angel or a thunder and all of that. He was immediately driven into the wilderness to be tempted. Hear that? He was immediately driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. See, that? there's that word temptation. So even our savior that died for us, that lived a very powerful life and literally capped it off and put the cherry on top by dying for our sins, all right? Even he was tempted, all right, he was tempted. And that's how you, you grow, all right? You grow, but you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing, like the scripture says a little, a couple of verses later, all right? You grow through those temptations, all right? The temptations can come at a, at, through something that you like very much, giving into it, or the temptation can come through something that you hate very much, that you despise. It could be either one. The temptation of the thing that you could despise would probably cause uh, sin in the area of, of uh, animosity and malice and hatred. The one that you love, the sin, the temptation that you have a have a taste for, all right, might if you give in to it, it might cause some very much guilty pleasure, all right, that Yah is not pleased with, that can really leave you in this area right here. You're being tempted at where you don't grow, you don't become perfect, you don't become complete, and all of that, an entire lacking nothing. All right. And therefore, even though you might have joy of eternal life, you don't have joy of the kingdom. All right. Hold on just a moment. You don't have joy of the kingdom. All right. And uh, I hear a lot of brothers talking, and I don't, I don't down my Hebrew as white brothers, because we're all in different levels of growth. 
all right? But getting the eternal life and getting the kingdom can be two different things, all right? You can have eternal life and not get the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's the reign of God on earth, right? It's the reign of God on earth. But the eternal life doesn't mean that you reign, you just have eternal life. You're there, you know, you're there in eternal life. In which David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to divide in the tents of the wicked. And I think that kind of explains it a little bit. He'd rather be a doorkeeper, that means he'd rather be a servant. That's what doorkeepers are, servants, all right? He'd rather be a servant, and, and in other words, not in the kingdom, but, but, but there in the house of the Lord, all right? That's, I think that explains eternal life. Eternal life is like you're there, you're a doorkeeper, all right, in the house of the Lord forever, all right? Like David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than abide in the tents of the wicked. And there's a joy with that, all right? But the kingdom is bigger, all right? The kingdom is bigger. The kingdom, you can't have the kingdom without eternal life, for one thing. But with the kingdom, you get the ultimate prize. A lot of people think that you get the ultimate prize is for having eternal life, all right? And most people believe that. But as you come up a little bit higher in understanding about the eternal life and the kingdom, you'll find out that not everybody that has eternal life is gonna reign. All right, not everybody has eternal life is gonna reign forevermore. What I mean reign is like have a crown on, wearing a robe, have a throne, stuff like that, you know? Be able to go out and kick some tails, you know, kick some demon butt, all right, with your sword, singing songs, victorious. That means you're famous in the kingdom, in the kingdom you'll be famous. If you get the kingdom, you're famous forever, all right? But if you don't get the kingdom, you have eternal life. You look at it just like people that's in the world. You got celebrities, all right? You got celebrities. And I'm not saying the celebrities in this world are, are righteous, no, by far. But I'm giving, just doing a little simile. You got celebrities and then you got common people that basically feed these celebrities their money because the celebrities are entertaining, they're fun, you know, and they get rich. Or making movies, you know what I'm saying? Or selling whatever it is that they sell with their name on it. These celebrities, you know, get rich off of their, their, their people celebrating them, all right? Well, look at the celebrity in the kingdom as the people that got the kingdom, all right? That's the difference, whereby you got other folks that are watching these celebrities that, that are uh, celebrating the celebrities are the common folks. So look at the common folk in the world, similar to those that have eternal life, all right? But the celebrity is the one that got the kingdom. That's what it's all about right there, all right? So, and those now, those are the ones that make the kingdom and have, you know, that have eternal life. But the ones that don't get any of that, you know, we don't want to talk about that. That's not a good thing right there. You know, that that person is most likely a devil. All right, not Yah's people, all right? So, so the key to all of this is joy, all right? With joy, you can get the kingdom, all right? With joy, you can receive the Holy Ghost, all right? Let me see if I can find some words on this word, some scriptures on this word joy. a whole lot, 155 words. Let's go down here to Acts. Because the disciples got, they got their butts beat for talking about Yahweh Shah. All right? We were just watching a movie on that too, but it's right there in the scripture. We run right past the book of Acts when the people that's in the temple warned them not to speak in the name of Jesus no more after they had crucified him and he had rose from the dead. The chief priest and them was like, you know, Oh, y'all out here teaching again this thing about Jesus? All right. Let's see. Here. All right. This X. 
Acts just try Acts eight. Acts chapter eight, verse seven, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice. These are the acts of the disciples uh, cast out devils and all of that. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and, the, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. That's great joy, let's go back, find some more. Joy search, let's see. He's still searching. Okay, there we go. Acts 13 52. All right. But the Jews, we started 1350, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of the coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. See, there it is right there. So you can have joy and not have the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and not be filled with the Holy Ghost. But you can still have joy. But they were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. All right. So when you get born again, just look at it. When you get born again, you get joy because of what Yahweh I did for you. But this is what you mainly want to be filled with, the Holy Ghost. Because when you go through some, uh, some testing and temptations and trials, you want some power. And with this Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can do all types of things. Remember, it was casting out devils in Acts chapter eight. That was with this Holy Ghost right here. But another thing that the Holy Ghost does, it gets you through your trials and your tribulations with joy. All right, it gets you through trial and tribulation. I'm preaching to not only people listening, but to my own self too. All right, letting it touch me also too, like a boomerang. All right, so we all have to be reminded. We have to be reminded of these things, all right? But it's joy that is your strength. The joy of Yahweh is your strength. In Nehemiah chapter 8. But in the New Testament, it's the joy of Yahweh is your strength. Plus, you got something greater than your joy, the Holy Ghost. And joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let's see. Let's, let's try to see these fruits. All right. Let's go over here to Galatians. Galatians. Let's see, let's try chapter five. I think we can find it there. Galatians five. Verse 16, therefore I, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, especially when you have the fullness of the Holy Ghost, you walk in the spirit. And the reason why you walk in the spirit is so you don't do the things of the flesh, because what happens with the flesh? The flesh brings death. It brings cursing and condemnation, all right? This is the reason why we don't want to sin, all right? Especially as the believers, because you reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, guess what you're going to reap? Flesh. The flesh lusts to, to, to death and breaks God's commandments. And it eventually it, it leads to death, cursing and, and all types of mishap, destruction. All right. This is why we don't want to do the things that Yahweh said not to do, because it leads to bad things for us. Galatians 5:17, for the flesh lusts up against the spirit. Notice that anything that lusts up against the Holy Spirit that gives us the victory. All right. It's trying to keep you from getting the victory. It's trying to keep you from getting the kingdom. All right, okay, you got joy because you, you have eternal life. Okay, let's stop it right, right there. We don't want you to get this right here, the spirit. All right, so the flesh lusts up against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. 
This is why reading the Bible all the time and finding out stuff that you didn't know that you were doing wrong is good. Because sometimes even though teachers might tell you, they might take your own Bible study to catch it. These are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. All right. And this is part of the, what we talked about the Melchizedek, uh, Melchizedek priesthood. All right. We are still liable to, to keep the works of commandments, you know, to do the commandments. Right here, but it says if you're, um, if you're led of the spirit, you're not under the law. And I would say right here, this law that it's talking about, it's talking about the law that was given because of transgression. Because at first, Yah gave the, the covenant to Israel, all right? And after they sinned, after they broke the law, broke the commandment and committed adultery spiritually against Yahweh at Mount Sinai with the golden calf, all right? Then he gave us the law, the book of the law that was to be put outside of the uh, outside of the ark. It was, and it was given because of transgression. This law was given because of transgression, but the commandments, all right, was given because of the covenant. And that's the difference. And what pe many people don't understand is that the, the covenant and the commandments in the covenant was original what was originally given to us, not the law. The law was like uh, putting somebody on probation after they, they done they got punished, and they get probation or whatever. They do so much so much other stuff after they get out of jail, all right, to complete the process. Well, that's what happened here. Yah punished Israel because of breaking the covenant and put us under the law. But if you if you're led of the Spirit and you got the Holy Ghost or you're born again, you start walking in the Spirit. You lay it at the spirit, you're not under that book of the law. All right. Not exactly. We won't go deep into that. We've already done some teachings on it in the past. You know, if you want to look at what we said about it, you can go back and and uh, look at some of the videos we've done beforehand. All right, which has something to do with the Mechizedek priesthood. All right. So under the Mechizedek priesthood. I might as well just say this at least. Under the Melchizedek priesthood, Yah gave us the uh, the covenant in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, the verse the chapter 24. Exodus 19 to Exodus 19 chapter to Exodus 24 chapter. The, that is the five chapters, I think five, four or five chapters that speaks about the covenant. Those are at Mount Sinai. All right. And the covenant was signed and sealed and delivered. And then Yah, God himself came down and had a paid work of a sapphire stone up under his feet and showed himself why they were eating because they had a covenant confirming meal. All right. But that was the covenant. And it was signed and agreed to and, and celebrated under the Melchizedek anointing. The Melchizedek priesthood was done away with after they sinned and they broke the commandment and committed adultery against Yahweh. And Yah put them under the Aaronic priesthood, which has something to do with this law thing right here. All right, put us up under the law until the coming of Christ. He took away all this condemnation because of this law. All right and brought us back onto the Melchizedek priesthood and he became our high priest, Melchizedek high priest, all right? Well, okay, let's go on. Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are deeds. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, immolation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, which I tell you, I, which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past, in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The key to this is that he's talking to believers and people that do these things of the flesh will not inherit what? It didn't say eternal life. Some people think that that's really synonymous, it's the same thing, but it really isn't. See, hold on just a moment. I got a question. 
to make sure I read it right. So Christians are low key, right? When they say the laws are done away with. Um, the Christians are, they don't know what they're talking about. Most of the Christians don't know what they're talking about when they say the laws are done away with. They're right about that, that the law, the law that, uh, let me see, how can I put it? The law that was given because of transgression, which is after the golden calf incident, the law that was given after Exodus chapter 19 uh, through 24. Hello, can you hear me? No, I mean, what I'm saying is, even though they may have taken it out of context, I mean, they, I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it's kind of low key correct as well. It's just more, it's more complicated and deeper than that, than how they just say it like that. Yeah, it is. It's deeper than that. And most Christians are heathen, which, and they talk about we're no longer under the law. Y'all was never under the law. <laughs> what law did he put y'all under? Well, I'm, I mean, okay, well, when I when I think of Christian, I think of black Christians, but I don't really oh. deal with white with white people. So, <laughs> yeah, was, so when I when I normally when I say Christian, that's who I'm thinking about as a black Christian. Okay, well, they are right to a certain degree. We, we, they don't go into this like I'm talking about, right? Like I can show you the scripture that says, uh, which were given because of transcripts. Let me go there real quick. We'll come right back to this. Uh, and a lot of this, what we're talking about, it took me years. It took me years to really get this correctly. Four verses, let's see. Hold on, we're gonna go down to the New Testament, which Paul, really Paul, a lot of people, especially Hebrew Israelites, don't understand Paul. But Paul, Paul was really <laughs> kind of tricky in his uh, in his explanations, but he was not wrong. Let's see here. Let's see, you're right on it though. Uh, and I mean, there's still aspects of the Mechizedek law we still should be following. Yeah, well, regardless, see, right? Remember the law, um, the law, the rest of the law that was given after the Golden Calf incident. That book was not even placed in the in the Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was placed outside of the Ark. All right, but it's still part of the law. All right, um, I would not tell anybody easily to just violate those laws. All right, but if you come and understand what we're talking about, um, what we're talking about now, then you know. Like for instance. Right now, I'm talking to you, I don't have fringes on with a ribbon of blue. But there was a time when I didn't understand what I understand now that I had to put them fringes on. All right? And Yah, Yah is going to judge you from where you're at. All right? So for me to say that the Hebrew Israelites, like I, you, I see, I see a lot of them with fringes. And for me to say that they're wrong would be wrong. All right? The reason why it would be wrong is because that's where they're at. All right, but remember, is Melchizedek is the Melchizedek priesthood is that eternal life or is that the kingdom? Let me see. I'm trying to find this particular scripture. 
the Melchizedek priesthood, is that eternal life or is that the kingdom? I would say that's the kingdom. Yeah. Because Melchizedek, even just the name tells you that. Melchizedek, Mel, Mel, Melchi, Mel, Melchi, I think is, that's how you say it. That means king. Melech, that's you know, the first part of the word Melech. Melchizedek. And the other part has something to do with priesthood. It's a deck, righteous. So it's a righteous king, which is a priestly king. All right. So the Melchizedek priesthood is really the kingdom that's coming. And that's what Yah was really giving us from the very beginning. We, and we messed up by worshiping the golden calf. All right. He was giving us the Melchizedek kingdom. Because we look at all the laws that, look at the commandments that he gave us instead of the, all of those other books. He only gave us four chapters of, of commandments. All right. But right off the top with the Melchizedek priesthood. But with the uh, with the Aaronic priesthood, that's what we came to. We got Aaron's priesthood. All right. Let me see here. There it is. Galatians three nineteen. So with the with the Aaronic priesthood, we got the other books. We got the fringes. With the Aaronic, Aaronic priesthood, we got even more holy days, all right? When he only gave us like, what, three? With the Melchizedek priesthood, he only gave us three times to be in Jerusalem. But with the Aaronic priesthood, it's seven times, uh, seven holy days throughout the year. All right, so let's see. Wherefore, Galatians 3.19, wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of what? See it, Galatians 3.19. What for serve the law? It was added because of transgressions. See? So the part of the law that was added was after, um, excuse me, Exodus chapter 24. All right? That's what many of us don't understand. So, I wouldn't put down people that don't understand this, but if you understand this, then you better do something about it. So like, like I just said, I don't have fringes on and I don't, I'm not condemned or convicted about it. Why? Because the part of the law that has something to do with fringes was added because of transgressions. All right. You understand that? And what you yeah. get, what you get instead of fringes, you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You get the Holy Ghost. Now, a lot of black Christians would tell you that the law is done away with. Then you have to go and tell them which part of the law, the covenant part or the transgression part. Then they might say, well, what are you talking about? That's when you got them. All right. <laughs> which part of the law is done away with? See? And it's, it's personal too. It's not just because Yahweh Shai died on the cross and rose again. That means everybody don't have to keep the law. All right. He made it personal. That means that if you if you don't come to this understanding, if you don't come to this understanding, right, about the Melchizedek priesthood, all right, and the law being done away with, and the Melchizedek priesthood still being relevant for today, you don't come to this then Yahweh Shai is going to wonder why you didn't have your friends or something. All right? If you, if you come to this understanding that the law is done away with, but you're wrong about the Melchizedek priesthood, he's going to still wonder why you was breaking his law. He's going to call you a worker of iniquity. But if you come to this understanding and you have Melchizedek, you understand the Melchizedek priesthood, you understand that Right there in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 19 through chapter 24, that, that was the covenant with the commandments, the original covenant that was the Melchizedek priesthood, not the Aaronic priesthood. If you come to that, you don't have fringes on. Your house is not going to be looking at you saying, why don't you have your fringes on? See? So it's personal. So there's some people who are going to wonder why, would, why they were not wearing their fringes. And there's other people who's going to wonder, uh, he's going to look at them, he's not going to wonder that. 
you know, he's going to say, well, damn, I get in faithful service. He's going to know you understood the Melchizedek priesthood. Some people are still under the ironic priesthood, put it that way. But the ones, a lot of these black Christians that are saying that the law is done away with, um, they don't understand that the, that the covenant is still relevant. The covenant is still binding. They're at Melchizedek, and they, they know that Melchizedek, yeah, Yahweh says I'm Melchizedek high priest, they know that, all right? But they think that the, the Sabbath is done away with, all the commandments is done away with. If you go from Exodus chapter 19 through chapter 24, you see the Ten Commandments, right? When God made the covenant with Israel, you see that he did the Ten Commandments right there. There's all types of laws or commandments right there in the Melchizedek priesthood. What's not there in the Melchizedek priesthood is the, is the fringes. There's a whole lot more, you know, but the fringes is not there. But it doesn't, it doesn't begin only at Exodus 19. It begins when, you, when the whole Bible begins, all the way to Exodus 24. I just normally just use Exodus 19 as that's when they come to the mountain and make the covenant. But in actuality, a lot of the things that, that the book of the law is talking about is already talked about before you get to Exodus 19, starting at Genesis, Genesis chapter one. All right, it's kind of complicated. But right here, let's read that again. Wherefore then serveth the law. And remember, when we're talking about the law, we're talking about things that was added because of transgressions. See? Did Yah add that at the covenant time because of transgressions? No. He didn't add a law at the time of the covenant in Exodus 19 because of transgressions. See, the law was only added at the time of the, of the Aaronic priesthood. When he made Aaron the high priest, if it, there's a change of the priesthood. Aaron became high priest when at first it was the Melchizedek priesthood. Why did Aaron become priest? Because of transgressions. All right, it was added because of transgressions till the seed, till the seed should come to whom the promises were made. Who, who was that seed? That was Christ, right? So it was added because of transgression till, check this out till the seed should come to whom the promises were made. So what would happen when he came? Then you don't have to serve the law, but you come to this by faith, all right? You come to this by faith. Really, if you understand, if you're there with the Melchizedek priesthood, all right, and you understand that this thing, all right, that's a sure sign of the kingdom for you, all right? But if you don't understand it, even if I'm talking to you right now, it might be because of the Holy Ghost that you still got to get that Holy Ghost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. All right. It might be. I'm not saying it's that's set in stone. All right. But uh, a lot of Hebrew Israelites, and I don't put them down for wearing their fringes. I wore them too. As a matter of fact, I, I still might get some shirts and put some fringes on. And Paul, what Paul did, Paul. The Apostle Paul would wear fringes around Hebrew Israelites that were wearing fringes, you know, so they wouldn't have to go into that, that topic. He didn't want to go into that topic, he just wears some fringes. All right. But let's see, wherefore then, let's go over this again. Wherefore then, serveth the law, it was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promises were made, and it was ordained by, the, by angels in the hand of a mediator. All right. So the, the black Christians, the black Christians that are saying the law is done away with, they don't do nothing. They are in danger of losing the kingdom, even if they're born again, all right? They're in danger of losing out on the kingdom. So you can argue with them until you're blue in the face. One of the major things I would tell them is that you can't get the kingdom if you're a work of iniquity. What is work of iniquity? Let's go right here, real quick, Matthew 7. You don't even have to argue with them. You just put, put this on them and turn around and bow face and march off. Not everyone, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the what? Into the kingdom. It didn't say you have eternal life. All right. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's the reign of God on earth. 
that means you're the you're one of the top dogs. Kingdom, let's see, that's got to be Basilia, Greek nine thirty two. Yeah, Basilia. All right, that means royalty. That is rule, a realm. See that rule or reign, realm. So there's believers that's gonna have eternal life. That's gonna have rule and reign. They're gonna rule. Not every person that has eternal life in the kingdom or in heaven is gonna rule. See, so not everyone that said them to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So what is the will of the Father? All right, the will of the Father is keeping the commandments. And then say the law, keeping the commandments. Yeah, how much I said, if you love me, you keep my commandments in John, I think it's John 14. John 14, verse 15, somewhere around there. If you love me, you keep my commandments, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father also. So that's the commandments. It's not the law. Notice that he says commandments, not law. Verse 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and, have done, and cast out devils and, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Matthew 7, 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The key to this whole verse right here, verse 23, is that word iniquity. Let's look it up real quick. 458 in the Greek. So what is this iniquity that would keep people from having the kingdom? That's saying, Lord, Lord, unto you, how I Which probably had eternal life. Anomia. Oh, anomia, it means illegality that is violation of the law all right violation in other words violation of his commandments in which basically you would have to go back to the law all right so black christians that haven't come to the mechizedek correctly should stay in the law until they get it to they understand it that means they should throw on their fringes they should stop shaving their beard stop shaving their head all right, they should go back to the law and then walk up out of there with Yahweh Shai. All right, that's what they should do. Because if they don't, if, you know, if they want the kingdom, let's put it that way, if they want the rule, the top reward for the kingdom, like Yahweh Shai was just saying, they should go back to the law. See, so there's, that's why I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't condemn somebody to keeping the law wearing fringes and, and doing all the stuff that the law says from Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I wouldn't put somebody down for doing what the law says. All right? Because he's gonna judge everybody from where they're at. All right? So they, they won't go to hell, put it that way. They won't go to hell. If, they, if they're born again, they won't go to hell. But they surely won't get the kingdom. What was the word right up there? What he just said? Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into what? The kingdom of heaven. He didn't say not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall have eternal life. He didn't say that. All right. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, you enter into the kingdom. That means have the rule and reign of God on earth in the end. See? And he tells you why they won't do it because they won't get it because they had iniquity. That means those black Christians that are saying the law is done away with and don't do nothing. They violate the Sabbath and all of that, eat pork and all of that. He's going to tell them, depart from me, you that work iniquity. That, that doesn't mean that they won't have eternal life but their reward won't be great. They won't have a reward, they'll suffer loss. They'll be weeping and gnashing their teeth. Catch that? They'll be, they'll be weeping and gnashing their teeth, why? Because they're gonna see these people that was with them have crowns on their head, they're gonna be powerful, they're gonna have swords, they're gonna have diamonds, they're gonna have all the great stuff of eternal life. And they're gonna have the kingdom. They had the opportunity to get the kingdom, but they chose to eat their pork. They chose to violate the Sabbath and say that the law was done away with and all that. And what did you, how should I call them? The worker of iniquity, all right? So especially our people should return to the commandments. They should return to the, 
to at least the covenant and trying to figure out this covenant. But there's a lot of them don't even believe that there is less. So what do they get? They, the best thing they got is eternal life. That means in the kingdom when that all of that is revealed, the best thing that they got is they just a commoner. They just common folk, all right? When they had the opportunity to be famous, to be great in Yah's kingdom, to rule, but they won't get it. But when they get there and see this, there's gonna be weeping and they're gonna be crying, gnashing the teeth. Not that they're gonna go to hell, but they're gonna see what they lost out on, all right? Let's go back here. So, so these are the ones that's in the flesh that won't get the kingdom, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Indians, murders, drunkenness, Galatians 5 21 is where I'm at, revelings and such a like, which I told you before, even as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit what? So those that say the law is done away with, all of these things that it said that the works of the flesh are, right? Starting at verse 19, Galatians 5, 19. All of these things have to do with breaking your house commandments. All right? It's, that's just not telling you which commandments. Some are, but some are not telling you which exact commandment it is. And Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or uh, Exodus. The works of the flesh, which I manifest, which are adultery, fornication, like that. all of these are breaking the commandments. But for somebody to say that the law is done away with, all right, is playing with fire, all right, especially our people. For them to say the law is done away with is playing with fire, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. That's what the law tells you not to do. Even the law that comes after the covenant tells us not to do these things. The commandments that comes after the covenant. Traditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, with such a like of which I told you in the past, as I also told you, told you before, told you in the times past, that they which do such things should not inherit the kingdom. See that? Should not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, but the fruit of the spirit. Is love, joy, peace, love, long suffering, gentleness. There's that word joy, we're just on this topic of joy. All right, joy is strength. Even if you don't have the Holy Ghost, it's strength. Even if you don't have the fullness of the Holy Ghost, it's strength. Peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, so it's not about just happiness and just running around. I'm happy, 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 and that means I'm a Christian. It's joy. Joy is the key to it. Joy is what you really want. All right. You have the, when you have joy, you have an inner witness in your heart. All right. It's an inner witness, a good spirit in your heart about the future, about what's going on, where you're at. All right. When you lose your joy, this is when people talk about dying and all of that stuff right here. When you lose this, even when people are dying and the guy's gonna take them, they got this right here. They're not dying, they're going to sleep, okay? They're not dying, they, they're going from joy to joy, victory to victory, all right? The body's going to sleep. But that joy is staying alive. You better believe it. This joy does not die. All right. But yeah, Christians, black Christians that are really Israelites, a lot of us, you know, let me put it this way we're stupid. We are, for one thing, we're stupid for not knowing who we are. All right are ignorant and we've allowed the slave master to tell us that we were not the people that we was that we really are and where did the slaves get the songs go down moses and tell pharaoh let my people go who taught them that 
they're coming from what Spain, Portugal, the West Coast of Africa, and they they in the fields harvesting the master's slave master's fields, talking, singing songs about swing low, sweet cherry. <laughs> And they were not allowed to read or go to church or anything. How did they get that stuff? All right. That right there should, you know, we should, our people should look at that, that the slave master didn't teach us those songs. They didn't teach us that. We were singing those things wherever we came from. We were singing those songs. Swing low, sweet cherry, coming forth to carry me home. You know, that was a, those, those are those are slave songs that slaves made up. All right. Now they were not allowed to go into church and sit down there with the slave Christians, with the master Christians and everything. How did, where did they get the songs from? Talking about crossing over Jordan. All right. And where they came from was not Israel exactly. They, you know, we know we originally come from Israel, but they, when they got, they got the slaves, they got them from the lands where they were exiled to. And they were still singing about the Jordan River, swing low, sweet chariot, and God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. If they weren't the Israelites, then who were they? So sometimes our people are stupid for not really studying our history. And that, that really, that, that really, Confirms who we really are. All right, there was no Jordan River in the west coast of Africa. There was no Jordan River in Spain and Portugal. So why were they singing about the Jordan River? All right, that right there should tell us we Israelites. Now, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost in 1984, the first one of the things that made me understand, okay, I'm Israelite, got that blood in me or something, because. Yah revealed himself to me wearing Jewish clothes, a black man wearing Jewish clothes. That's when I knew I said, okay, something about my bloodline. I had an idea of what it, what it was, but I was not totally correct either at the time. I had a good idea, all right? Why the man standing in the doorway that was spiritual or supernatural had Jewish clothes on. He was a black man, all right? I knew my great-grandmother that my great-grandfather had married was Jewish. He was a Haitian, he was a black Haitian, but she was Jewish. I knew that and I kind of wondered, maybe that's the reason why the man standing in the doorway has Jewish clothes on, because I got Jewish, some type of Jewish blood in me. But what I found out in the end was that it was not my great grandmother that was Jewish, which she really was. It was the slaves, it was the black man that was exiled from his original land that were Israelites, they were, they were the original Jews. That's what I found out in the end. All right, the black folks were the Jews. That's even why the man standing in the doorway was a black man wearing Jewish clothes. All right, so I had a clue and I, when Yah finally revealed it to me, you know, and I, I, from that time on, I started studying and here voila, we're still studying. And I, this was before, the internet, all right? This is before IUIC. IUIC came out in 2000, somewhere around there. And when, as a matter of fact, when I started really looking for it on the internet for people that believe like me, that was not much on the internet. I had to really search for people that believe that we were Israelites, all right? All of this is brand new, the Hebrew Israelites on the internet. I think Yahweh did that so we would revive, we would, we would join and we would, we would uh, gather ourselves together through the internet. I think that's what happened. But at the time when Yah, when, I, when it finally got through to me that we were Israelites, that was nothing, I, I, I didn't even have an internet. There was, you know, there was computers, but the internet was not the internet where you can get on there and say, oh, that's what it is. Where is it like? No, it wasn't like that. Yah revealed that to me by the spirit way before all of this. And revealed to me that the blacks in America were Judah and that I was Levi. Revealed, it revealed that to me before any, I saw any 12 tribes chart. Revealed to, re revealed to me that I was Levi. Yeah. 
sure did. A lot of the reason why a lot of our, our brothers and sisters are locked up in prisons and prison houses and all of that stuff is because of a lack of knowledge of this stuff right here when we're talking about. That's the reason why we went to prisons and we've been in, in trouble with the law and all of that is because we are Israelites and we don't know it. So the church system that's saying that the law is done away with is hurting our people. And as a matter of fact, I've looked at the black community for a long time. You know, I'm in my fifties and I seen a black community as a child that was thriving, it was beautiful, all right? But the black community in America has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. It really has. If you got Christ in your community, it should not get worse, worse, and worse, and worse. It should get better and better and better and better. So something's wrong with our community, our, 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 our spirituality. Now the Muslims will say it's because you got the wrong religion. Our religion is Islam, brother. All right? The Muslims will say that. No, that's the Arabs' religion is Islam. It's not the African American. It's not the Negro's religion. With the Islam, we get worse and worse and worse also. And with Christianity, the white man's version of our Bible, we got worse and worse and worse and worse. But if we come back and realize that we're those chosen people and return to the covenant, even if you have to return to the law that's been, that's been knocked out by the death of Christ, he's not gonna hold you down. He's not gonna, he's not gonna condemn you for keeping the law. As a matter of fact, the law brought us to Christ, didn't it? Let me see if I can find something real quick. The law was a schoolmaster. Let me see if I can find that real quick, that word schoolmaster. All right, just to be sure. Let's see, school. I think I spelled it wrong. There it is. Galatians 3. This is not that far from it. Galatians 3, 23, but, the, but before faith came, so we're basically, Paul is saying we're really under faith, all right? Before faith came, we were kept under the law. So you see this? Before faith came, we were kept under the law. What law? The law of transgressions that happened because of transgressions, because of the golden calf incident at Mount Sinai. We was kept under that law, under the Aaronic priesthood. The Aaron's priesthood, we were kept up under. Shut up unto the faith that should afterwards be revealed. So after the law was done, when the law is done away with because of the blood of Christ, we will now go back to faith, which is the Melchizedek priesthood. All right? We will shut up unto the faith that, would, that should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, then, wherefore the law, here's the key, Galatians 3, 24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. See that? The law of the key word here, schoolmaster. So basically we had to grow up when Yah gave us the law after we did the golden calf incident, he basically put us under a schoolmaster. So we would, in our understanding, come unto Christ. You, you just couldn't tell somebody the, the story and then they, they get it. It had to be done, it had to be practiced, it has to be faith, all right? It has to be done by faith. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, all right? So even though Christ has already come and died and went back to heaven, some of us still need where we're at, especially when Christians saying the law is done away with, they need the, they need the law. 
And what would happen is this schoolmaster, if they go back to the law where their fringes and all of that, stop shaving their beard, stop shaving their head. There's all, there's all types of Michael Jordan bald head folks in the church nowadays, all right? If there's any men in there, they Michael Jordan bald head, all right? And that's against the law. And even if you got the Mekhazadek priest that you don't shave that hair off your head. You don't shave that hair off your face. You don't do that. All right. You know, that's what the law taught us, you know, how to do this thing. Right. And even if you come to the Mekhazadek priesthood, now you know that Abraham is not walking around with a bald head. All right. Isaac or Jacob was walking around bald headed. You know, bald face. All right, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ. So which law was that? It was not the covenant law, it was the transgression law was our schoolmaster and that's what he put us up under. In the Aaronic priesthood, we were put up under the schoolmaster to bring us into Christ. So what I would tell, what I would say that to any of our people, start back here with the schoolmaster. That's where I was at. I was at the schoolmaster to Yah by faith showed me Melchizedek. Now it's right there in the book of Hebrews about Melchizedek, Yahweh Shai being our Melchizedek priest, but you can see something but not understand it. I didn't understand it like I understand it. So I would tell most, most of our people, guess where they're at? They're right here at the schoolmaster. They, some of them are not even at the schoolmaster. They lowered and then going to school, they dropouts, all right? <laughs> dropouts. That's, that's funny. A lot of our people have been born again and dropped out of, out of elementary school, not high school. They dropped out of elementary school. All right. And you think that's going to get the kingdom? No. No. This right here, this schoolmaster is going to do you good. And they don't think that I'm religious and crazy. Well, let them think that. As long as you get the kingdom. Let them, let them think that, let them believe. As a matter of fact, get away from them. Anybody that, <laughs> anybody that thinks righteousness is crazy, get away from that person, all right? Stay with that, note that person and get out of there. The Bible says that, uh, the scripture says that depart from the presence of a foolish man when you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. Let me see if I can find that for you. Some of us should not be talking to some of these people. Because if you're weak in the faith, they will surely get you. All right. Just like them, you'll be just like them. Knowledge. You don't want to be talking to some folks if you're weak in the faith that definitely don't have faith. But they will encourage you in your weakness. Let's see. Proverbs 14, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. See that? Proverbs 14, 7. Go from the presence. And that word presence, 50, 48. And then you don't have, you know, we already know that. I mean, you go from the, go from that person, period. And then go hang out with them. 5048. Nagid, Naged. Some of these words you might notice uh, sounds like nigger, all right? Because the word nigger is a good word in Hebrew, all right? All right, let's see. Uh, go from a front that is part, opposite, specifically a counterpart. Or made usually, uh, let's see, basically go from get out of their face. Right here it says a front. All right. That means they gate their front. Get away from around them. Don't be sitting up there talking to them in their face. All right. So go from the presence, go from their face of a foolish man when I perceive it not in him the lips of knowledge. All right, so you see some you see some black Hebrew Israelites that saying they're not Hebrew Israelites, saying the law is done away with. You sitting there arguing with them. If you if you see that person 
has got a clue, you could probably bear with them. And you see that person's a dummy, nothing but the dummy. So help him, God, get out of there. That person's trying to overthrow your faith. Especially if you weaken the faith. All right. You weaken the faith, that means you, you got a little word in you. Get out of there. Especially if this person is uh, very scholarly in there and their stupidity. There's, you know, this white Christianity, they're scholarly and white Christianity that says the laws are done away with. The law is done away with. They're scholarly in that, and you're not scholarly in anything, but knowing the truth and believing what, what I'm talking about right here, get out of, get away from that person and send them to a Hebrew Israelite that will sit there and laugh at them. And after bringing out all these scriptures, that's telling them the truth and laugh at them because that's what they deserve. Some shame, all right? Because they saying that Yah's laws are done away with. And that's nowhere in the scriptures, all right? That's nowhere in the scriptures. I'm gonna read that again. Go from the presence of a foolish man. It calls that person a foolish man. So what are our people that are in these churches? That get worse and worse every generation. Our neighborhoods look like a, a war zone. Some of them, I can go outside the house and get in the car and just drive about maybe a mile down the street and there's a war zone. Look like they had war and somebody tore up all the houses around them. And it's nothing but an African American neighborhood, it's a minority neighborhood. Why? What happens? And there's churches all over the place. That's what happens in churches, all right? But when you get the real thing, the truth, like what we're talking about, it, and you get a lot of people that's believing the truth, all right? That's what the church is all about. It's a body of believers coming together. And by being in that assembly, you have the body of Christ. You have miracles. You have all types of powerful stuff going on. And that's what they wanted to take away from our people because we are those people. We are those people that if we get together with the truth, we assemble, guess what? Yahweh is coming back, all right? And it's starting to happen. And he, with the internet and stuff, it's starting to happen, literally. Let me see the scripture. Let me see something real quick. But we're right up on it. Let's go to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, Zeke 64. Isaiah 64, this, this is some good stuff. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and that thou wouldest come down that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. So Isaiah is saying, oh, that thou wouldest come down from the heavens. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. There's a time when I thought Yahweh shy really was Yahweh. I'm going to be honest with you, but that's not too far off. Many people think Yahweh Shai is God. But I found out, and yeah, he came down and he revealed it to me himself, that no, that's not the truth. I, you know, I heard other brothers talking about it, that Yahweh Shai was not God, but it took the spirit to tell me. All right? But Isaiah is talking right here about Yah. Let me see, hold on just a minute. Yeah. Isaiah right here is talking about Yah himself, not Yahweh Shai. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when, as when the melting of fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thy adversary, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. So what's, what's coming? Remember at Mount Sinai, who came down upon the mountain? That was Yahweh, right? Yahweh spoke to, to Israel from heaven on Mount Sinai, which ought to have been a, an incredible sight. And we see that the Israelites were afraid. And I, I would be afraid, we would be afraid if we was there on that mountain too with them. All right. The earth at eight o'clock in the morning turned dark like as if it was midnight. All right. And Yah came down in fire on the top of the mountain. And when every time he spoke, 
I can, <laughs> you know, I was in the army and uh, I think I've told this story before, but we had the day when we, in basic training, I was an armor specialist. That means we the ones that took care of the tanks. We the one that drove the tanks and fired the tanks and all of that. And uh, so we had our day where we all got in those tanks and we fired away at the targets, like a mile, two miles down the road. And you could see it in the scope and all of that. And they had many tanks there, like 20 tanks. And we all had to wait on our turn. And I can remember every time I, one of those tanks blew up, it, it fired, you would jump. You see dogs do that on 4th of July. Every time a firecracker go off, they pow, they, they jump, it's, it, it bothers them. Well, these tanks are so loud, all right, where even the earplugs didn't do any justice because the, the, the firing of that tank, the vibe of it, the, 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 uh, the, the pressure of it would, would hit you, not just in the ear, it would hit you in your body. You would jump, all right? Well, I can imagine that the voice of Yahweh was like that or worse, where you had to get away, you had to get a distance away from him if you're gonna hear his voice and not be afraid. Moses said, I exceedingly fear and tremble of what the scripture says, all right? Because he came down and he started speaking. Right here is talking about in Isaiah 64 is when the fire burning, when the, when, when, when the melting fire burning the fire causes the waters to boil. So he came down in flame and fire. He said to make thy no, name known to thy adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Why would the nations tremble at Yahweh's presence? Because it's like those tanks going off. That's how his voice sounds. There's another place, there's a few other places I can take you to, but I'm not going to do it right now, where it says the voice of Yahweh splitteth the cedars. Now, you know, I, we know a cedar of Lebanon is a huge tree. If the voice of Yahweh causes that tree to blow up, pow! All right? That's how powerful his voice is. All right? And that the, that, that the nations may tremble, that's what's going to happen. And Isaiah is telling us a little bit right here. And Yahweh is going to come down. So let's look at it again. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and come down. What's going to happen? Yahweh is going to come down in the latter day. Just like he did at Mount Sinai. All right. He's going to come down. And the nations will tremble at his presence. When thou, verse 3, when thou didst terrible things which we look not for. So Israel did not look for all of that to happen. So when thou didst terrible things which we look not for. So what's going to happen? Something's going to happen that we it's going to be again. It's going to be a surprise. We're not going to we're not looking for what's going to really take place. All right, but he's coming down again. But this time it's going. To, now I got an idea. I think God's let me in on it a little bit because He does nothing unless He reveals it first to His prophets. Right? His prophets. Yah would do nothing unless He first reveal it to His prophets. I think Yah has let me hit hit me onto it that when we see. When we see the one sitting on the throne dwelling among the people, in order for him to dwell among the people, he's going to have to be in a situation where it will not harm his people for him to dwell among the people. And we know if his voice causes the cedars of Lebanon to blow up and splits the divides the rocks into and, and causes the rocks to go become chalk, stone, you know, powder. You know that if he's around us, he's amongst us, he's gonna kill us. <laughs> and that's what Israel said. If we speak to us anymore, we're gonna die. You go up there and talk to him, Moses, because if he talk to us anymore, we're gonna die. Our lives are over with. So he's gonna do something a little different. I think what it is is that man that sits on the throne is gonna dwell among the people. It's gonna be down here. He's gonna basically have to manifest himself in, in regular human flesh. Just like a regular human being. All right. And we're not looking for it. And he's gonna be come, he's gonna be changed. He's gonna be like a regular human being. He's gonna be changed. What is he gonna, how is he gonna be changed? That body that Yahweh Shai rose from the dead in is his body. So what we got with Yahweh Shai, we got the body of Yahweh. So some people might not understand what I'm trying to say. The Yahweh Shai 
in him, it didn't say he is the fullness of the God here, probably. It says in him dwells all the fullness of the God here, but so that means the body of Yahweh Shah, the fleshly part of Yahweh Shah, is what live, is what is the physical body of Yahweh. Put it that way. So the fleshly part of Yahweh Shah Mashiach is the physical part of Yahweh himself. All right. So what happens is, is that this Yahweh puts on Yahweh Shah. But before he does that, he's going to be a regular human being, like anybody else. That's that's was incredible. Now, I think Yahweh revealed this to me because if Yahweh Shai is not Yahweh, then who is what? Who and what is he? All right, he is the body, the physical embodiment of Yahweh. What does that mean? Is that saying Yahweh Shai is Yahweh? No, it's saying that he is the physical apparatus. Just like my body, you can look at me. My body is the physical apparatus of me, of my person. Is my body me? Uh, I would say not so. My body is a part of me. Okay? My body is a part of me. It's not literally me. Okay? And that's what's going on with Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai is the physical part of Yahweh. Okay. So what happens is this man that sits on the throne up in heaven will eventually put on the physical part of himself, which is Yahweh. And when that happens, that's when why Yahweh literally always said, the son of man, the coming of the son of man. Why does he say, why don't he just say, come on, say, when I come back and I'm gonna do this, when you see me coming from the clouds, you know, he's always talking about the son of man. Why is he doing it like that? It's because he knows that the son of man in the latter days is, a, is literally Yahweh himself putting him on. All right? So he's speaking in the second person, not in first person, like as if it's him. Why? Because it ain't literally him, it's Yahweh. So what, what we have here, Isaiah 64, when thou this terrible thing which we look not for, I believe that this terrible thing that he's going to do when he comes down the second time, and that we're looking for is that he's going to put on Yahweh Shah. He's going to be in the earth already, but he's going to put him on. So Yahweh Shah is in heaven waiting on Yahweh to put him on and come down. So when thou this terrible thing which we look not for, thou camest down. See that? Thou camest down. So Yahweh Shah is not Yahweh. But this Yahweh that is the creator of all things is going to come down. All right. And in Revelation chapter 7, it says he's going to dwell among the people. He's going to be with the people. So that has to be the body of Yahweh Shah. That's with the people. The lamb. He's going to put the body of the lamb on. Thou camest down, the mountains flow down at thy presence. Verse four, for since the beginning of the world, men have, have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee. Nobody's seen this, beside thee, what, what he had prepared for him that waited for him. So check this out. Neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee. God has seen it, Yahweh has seen it, and no one else has seen it beside thee. And Yahweh, I say, even the son of man, even, even the son does not know the day of his coming. Yahweh, I said that. Basically said he don't even know. All right. What he had prepared for him. What he had prepared for him. Who is the him right here? For him. That waited for him. Oh, boy. <laughs> I should not have jumped on this topic. What he had prepared for him. Who is this him? That waited for him. All right. And it's talking about God coming down. But no one has seen, no eye has seen, and has not been deceived by the ear. The eye has not seen, no God beside thee, what, what he had prepared for him that waited for him. Now, the one that would perceive this, check this out. The one that, that would perceive this is, guess who? God. 
Let's read that again. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he had prepared for him that waited for him. So who's the one that's going to perceive? God. So who is this him right here? Prepare for him. This has to be him, God. So if he's going to come down again, that son of man that's coming out of the out of the sky is come as the body of Yahweh. But it is this man right here, the one that sits on the throne. And let's let's go here, let's go down a little further. Let's see Revelation. When the sixth seal is open, Revelation chapter six. Hold on just a moment. Revelation chapter six, I think it's verse 11, verse 12, yeah. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake. And this is really around that time when he bows to heaven and come down again. This is when Yahweh comes down again, like he did on Mount Sinai. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heaven, the stars of heaven, fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts up her untimely figs when she is shaken up a mighty wind. That's something else, because when he comes down, all of that stuff that they set up there in that atmosphere is coming down too. <laughs> right? And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. I've heard many Hebrews that I say that this is nuclear bombs going off, all right? And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the, and the great men, and the rich men and the chief captain, remember the nations are trembling at his presence, like Isaiah 64 said, and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. What, they, what y'all hiding for? Verse 16. And said unto the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sit upon the throne. Look at this. The face. 4383. Let's see, let's see what the word face means in Greek. That's in, written in Greek. Prosopine. Visage. All right. It means visage. And we know visage means continence or face or appearance. Front, the front, and we just read that in another scripture. It says, Go from the presence of a foolish man when you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. And when it says, Go from the front, the face, all right, it's being towards view that is, countenance, aspect, appearance, surface, presence, person, outward appearance. All right, so when it says the face, the outward is saying that the outward appearance of Yahweh is going to be seen. We see Moses looking at him and couldn't look at him in his face. He had to see the back parts of him in the book of Exodus, I think it was. Exodus chapter 30, 30 something, 34, where he had, you know, he, he asked to see Yah's glory and he could not look at him in the face because no one could see him and live, but he could see the back parts. And he saw the back part of Yahweh. Right here it says, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So the face, that means Yahweh himself is coming down. All right? So when we see Isaiah, let's go back to Isaiah. No, let's not go back to Isaiah. When we see Isaiah talking about, uh, oh, that thou wouldest come down and that thou wouldest, uh, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. All right? As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil to make thy name known to the adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence. This is what's going on right here. Isaiah is basically telling us that Yahweh is going to come down again. All right? He's going to come down again, but in order for him to get the body of Yahweh shy, he's going to have to be a regular man in the earth before that happens. He's going to have to have gotten the victory by faith. So basically, he's going to be a partaker of salvation himself. Let's continue to read this. 
hide us from the face of him that sit upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Yeah. For the great day of his wrath is coming, he should be able to stand. So what's going on? That the face of him that sit upon the throne and this lamb right here is the same thing. When you see his face, guess who you're looking at? You're looking at the lamb that died on the cross 2,000 years ago because he takes on that body. All right. And all that, that, all that this lamb was able to achieve, all right, including the throne of David, all right, this one that sits on the throne gets it. It makes sense. Sit up on the throne. Sit up on what throne? The one in heaven and the one on the earth. All right. That means Yahawashai, if you really, if you really study Yahawashai's genealogy, Jeconiah says that he is the lamb, cannot sit up on the throne. He can't sit up on the throne of David. That's the reason why you didn't, you didn't see any more kings after the Babylonian captivity. Because the, the lineage of Jeconiah was cursed. So in actuality, Yahawashai cannot sit up on the throne of David. So he has to give this throne to someone else. And that's the one that sits on the throne in heaven. But what's, what's going on? The one that sits on the throne in heaven is coming down with the body of Yahweh Shai. So basically you can say Yahweh Shai is, his body is sitting on the throne, but the one that's inside his body, the fullness of the God here, is the one that's really sitting on the throne. It's hard to describe it. I'm trying to explain it as best as I can. But Yahweh Shai in the one that sits on the throne looked just alike. Basically, Yahweh Shai, this lamb, is the outward expression of the one that sits on the throne. He's the outward expression. But a great day of his wrath is coming, who should be able to stand. All right. Let me go back up here again. So this is, I, I sometimes I read these scriptures and I, I just look at how this thing is going to take place. All right, how this thing is going to take place. Really, we should be, we should be joyful. But all of this stuff that Yah allows to come upon us, uh, is so that we can be ready for this right here. All right, which is going to be a very powerful thing, because if Israel in the beginning was not able to even hear His voice and ask Moses to go up there and talk to Him, all right. You know that this second time he comes down, it's going to be something else. You better be ready. All right. You have to, we have the tools to be ready for this. All right. He's given us the tools. He's given us the blood washing of the Lamb, given us the baptism of the Holy Ghost if you so receive it. All right. And I would say for anybody, if you've been born again, now see, you can ask you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All right. And this is what's going to give you power to, guess what, to stand. Let me see, there's the word stand right there. And it's because the question is, it's not saying, it's not saying nobody's able to stand. It says, who shall be able to stand? The ones that basically were walking with him and going through trial and tribulation by the power of the Holy Ghost are the ones that when he comes from that sky, um, won't be ashamed, you know. Let me show you some more scriptures. Because the ones that didn't abide in him that called themselves believers won't be able to stand. They're going to be put to shame. Let's see. Let me find that scripture. First John 2, 28. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So if you're not, if you just like the heathen falling all over the place and being rocked by his coming, that's gonna be a shame for you. That's why you wanna go through, we, we all wanna go through and 
and abide in him, all right? That means whatever we, he allows us to go through, take it and pray, and get on your knees and ask you how to give, it, give you the victory over it, all right? Because it basically has something to do with his coming. So when he shall appear, we may have confidence. Let's see what 3954 in the Greek, the word confidence. Par, parhesia, par, parhesia, 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 all right, 3954 in the Greek. Um, all outspokenness, that means it would be bold. But he comes down with that loud voice and that glory that's hard to look at, that has the nations run into the dens and caves and rocks of the mountains. And you're out there outspoken talking loud, that is frankness, bluntness, publicity. See that? You're not running to the mountains and the rocks. You're standing. Publicity, by implication, assurance, bold. You're not afraid of Yahweh's coming. All right? Because his coming is coming to set you up on eye. His coming is to put a robe and a crown on your head. Confidence. All right, so this is the reason why you want to go through trial and tribulation now, no matter how hard it is. Because what he, what he allows to come upon you is basically his coming. His coming is coming. You know, he, when you go through trial and tribulation, it's his coming. All right, to prepare you for his coming. Let me read that again. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him that is coming. Let's look at the word of shame, one, Greek 153. Oh, that's a hard word right there. <laughs> Let me see if I can see it. I he school, no more he. I he school, no more he. No more he. I ain't going to say it no more. Disfigurement. That is disgrace. So this was going to happen. This is why you want to, as a born again person, you want to go through all that you have to go through and just trust that Yah is the one that's allowing it. And he'll give you the victory of it. Because you don't want to go through, what is it, disfigurement, disgrace, to feel shame for oneself, be ashamed. You don't want to be ashamed of him, of him that is coming. Shame before him, excuse me, not of him. You want to be ashamed of him because he's coming in great glory. All right? You, won't, you don't want to be ashamed before him at his coming. All right. So that's the reason why we want to go through trial and tribulation. It's hard. You know, it's hard, but it's to prepare all his children for his coming. So that, you know, if he's going to dwell among the, let's look at some more scripture. He's going to dwell among the people. He's dwelling among people that are not, that are not ashamed when he comes. Let's see, Revelation. Seven. We got the hundred and forty-four thousand here. Revelation seven thirteen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which I read in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes. The, the word tribulation there is key. If you go through tribulation for the cause of Messiah, for the cause of Yahweh, and you overcome and you come out of it because you trusted in Yahweh, all right? You're going to be one that's going to be able to dwell around Yahweh when he's manifested. And there, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that, watch this, and he that sitteth, let me highlight this, and he that sitteth upon the throne shall dwell among them. Oh, my goodness. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. See that? Remember, that's the same one that Moses could not look at him. And he would die if he looked at him in his face. He had to see it behind the parts in the, in the Exodus chapter 33, 34, one of those chapters. But here he is dwelling among the saints in the latter days. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them anymore. 
uh, any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto living fountains of the waters. And God, He's the one that sits on the throne. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All right. Let's see some more scripture right here about the power of going through tribulation so that you can dwell among, dwell with Yahweh, the one that sits on the throne. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in Yahweh and in the power of his might. Look at that. How can you be strong in Yahweh and in the power of his might? 2904 in the Greek is the word for power. Let's look at it. Kratos. Uh, the primary word for bigger, great, literally or figuratively, dominion, power, strength, might. And then all of these things is what the Holy Ghost, the baptism and the power the Holy Ghost gives you. And the power of his might, not your might. All right. So you would have to do it in the Holy Spirit. And remember, when, it, when, you, when, when you are weak, he is strong. That's the thing about this thing, too, because we want to be, most of us men want to be strong all the time. Never come in the power of our might. But it's usually when you're at your end, that's when his strength kicks in. That rhymes up. When you're at your end, his strength kicks in. That's why you want this power of the Holy Ghost. When you're at the last part, you get the last little thread of your rope, his power takes over. So then it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the whole thing is, is that Yah is going to allow all his children to go through. All right. He's going to allow all his children to go through to prepare for this day that's coming. All right. And the reason why he does it is because he loves you, because he wants to be with you. He wants you with him. All right. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation and speak of unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of Yahweh, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. All right. For whom Yahweh loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son he receiveth. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So, in other words, the ones that's going to have the kingdom, all right, the ones that's going to have the kingdom in the end, that's going to be heirs of the kingdom that are believers, basically they're gonna be called his sons. The ones that just have eternal life are, are less than what you would call sons, all right? So to, to be called a son of God would automatically say you that you inherit the kingdom. So sons are the ones that inherit, all right? So if you, if you don't inherit the kingdom, then you are not his son, you might've been his child that means you're too young for the kingdom to rule and reign you're not there at that level but the ones that are there at that level are called sons but what son is he whom the father chastens not the reason why he chastens you is so that you can be worthy but if you're if you be without chastening chastisement where of all are partakers then are you bastards and not sons so that means that the ones that are going to be weeping and gnashing the teeth because they didn't inherit the kingdom, are called bastards. Let's look at this, 3541. That means they despised that chastening, the trouble, the testing that Yah was putting upon them so that they could overcome and be ready for his coming. They despised it. Bastard, 3541. Note those, uh, uncertain affinity, a spurious or illegitimate son. All right. Now, the thing about this bastard word right here, if you do without chastisement, which are all the partakers of, and you are a bastard because you didn't have chastisement, it doesn't mean that this person is not born again. It's right, that word says uh, spurious, 
illegitimate. Spirits are illegitimate son. Born outside the house somewhere. All right, you don't, why? Because you despise, let's go back there. You despise the chastening of Yahweh. My son despised, what's that word, despise 36, 43 in verse five. That's another one of those hard words. Olo Gorio, Oreos or something, I don't know. But uh, anyway, 36.43, uh, to have little regard for, that is to disesteem, to despise. So if you despise Yahweh's chastening hand on you, I have little esteem for it and don't like it and scoot it to the side, all right? What you gonna do with the joy he gave you, all right? It's considered all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, okay? And this is coming back at me. I throw that boomerang and it comes, gives me back in here too. So I, it's, I, but I like it because I, you know, we, need, we all need encouragement because we're all going to be tested. Even the ones that, that, that despise the chastening, it's going to come to you. You're going to, just the ones that despise the chastening, going to find another way other than walking in the spirit to deal with. It. And that's what you don't want to do. You want to stay in the spirit, all right? But the ones that stay in the spirit and walk with Yah through their, ch their chastening and their chastening and their trials are the ones that's going to be probably ready for the king. Those are the ones that Yah wants to call his son. The Yahweh Shai um, do a juke step on the cross, say nope, and juke step, and then go to the Garden of Gethsemane, went somewhere else. <laughs> and he didn't know. He went straight there where Judas was going to get ready to lead those bands of. Uh, soldiers to, to capture him. He knew what was going to happen. He asked his father to take the cup away from him, but he knew it wasn't the father's will. He was there for that reason. And he was ready for the test. So that's how you got to be as a, as, as a son of God. You can't, you can't try to juke step out of the test. If you do, it's going to come back again when you're ready. In order for you to move, if you're at that point, like your house I was, all right, and you get a point in your life where there's some trials and tribulations coming your way, and you juke step and get out of it, guess what? When you get yourself ready, you say, okay, God, here I come. Guess what's going to be there waiting for you? Your test that you just juke stepped out of, all right? Because he's not going to allow you to totally get out of the test and trials. Because he's trying to prepare you for his coming. Because he loves you because he wants the best for you, all right? Best thing to do a lot of times is to get in a community, get around people that's gonna talk to you the right stuff. It's gonna tell you the righteous thing, that's gonna encourage you to go through. That's the best thing. You don't wanna be around people saying the law is done away with and all that, because, <laughs> you know, man, oh man. You don't wanna be around people like that. And the devil's not fighting against those people too, believe it or not. The devil is not fighting against people saying the law is done away with. He's not fighting them. All right? He's leaving those folks alone. Why would he fight against them? All right. But we see here in Revelation, this great red dragon that fought against the woman and her child, her man child. All right, we see right here, that when it's all said and done, it says verse 17, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What's first? Is it testimony of Jesus or the commandments of God? The commandments of God. The dragon went forth to, to wage war against the people that keep the commandments of God. Not only believe in Jesus, but they, first of all, they keep the commandments. It didn't say the law. You notice that? It didn't say to keep the law. Keep the commandments of God. All right? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They have both. They have the commandments and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are the ones that the dragon is fighting against. Satan is fighting against. He's not fighting against those who say the law is done away with. They, they violate all the laws and eat pork and, and shave their heads and beard and and I 
he's not, let's put it that way. He's just not coming after them because he don't have to worry about it. He already got them. He already got them. He got them by receiving them that they didn't have to keep the commandments of God. All right? The law or commandments or whatever. Which is really the commandments, you know? Because that's the Melchizedek part of it. It's commandments. Let's go through that. Ex, uh, Exodus chapter 19 through chapter 24. Those are commandments that God gave. They were not laws. Now, after Exodus 24, you started chapter 25, those are laws. All right, there's more going into the law stuff. All right. So they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. These are enemies of the dragon. So if you start keeping the commandments with the faith of Jesus. The devil is coming at me, all right? And the one that's above the devil is Yah. So who are you going to get mad at, the devil or Yah? You don't get mad at any one of them because the devil, the devil can only get at you if Yah allows it. And Yah sometimes allows it so that you can be ready for his coming. So you can overcome. What happened with Job? He tempted, he tested Job with Satan. And Job hung on in there and was patient. And he got victory in the end. And that's what the reason why the book of Job is in the scriptures. It's for our admonition, for our encouragement. All right. So whatever God allows the devil to do to us, if we do what Job did, we go all the way through. By the power with the power of the Holy Ghost, we're gonna get we can come out victorious. Amen. We're gonna come out victorious. But without this, without these commandments, there's no kingdom. So what, what is the devil fighting against? He's fighting against the kingdom. All right. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is gonna be here on earth. How do you know that? Okay. And we're gonna shut this down in a second or two. And in Revelation chapter 5, we got people bowing down before the Lamb, giving them honor and homage. All right, before the Lamb in heaven, heaven recorded. They sung a new song, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seal, therefore thou wast slain, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue, people, and nation, and has made us unto our God, watch this, made us unto our God, kings and priests. That's the Melchizedek, see that? Melchi said that. Has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign on the earth. So why is the dragon fighting against those that have the commandments of God, testimony of Jesus? because they're gonna reign on earth. That's the kingdom, all right? And we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard a voice, the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. All right. So Yahweh's blood caused that to happen for the saints to reign on it. But not only does his blood did that, but keeping the commandments did that too. They kept the commandments and when they failed, the blood of Yahweh washed it, washed their sins with when they repented. That's what made them eligible for, to reign on the earth in the kingdom. They were made kings and priests. And that's what the Melchizedek priesthood is. And that's what Yahweh Shai, excuse me, that's what Yahweh, God, was originally trying to give us before we, before we worship the golden calf. He was trying to give us a Melchizedek king. All right. Praise Yah. Well, I'm going to let everybody go on this one. It's been a long time. I've been feeling better. Yeah, it's blessing me. You know, I used to, for a while there, I, I was coming on here, my hand was shaking and I could not, it still got a little tremor. But thank you for those that's been praying for me. You know, Yah is coming through. And this is a testimony of, of testing that Yah might allow to come upon us, of uh, tribulation. 
Remember, Job, most of his tribulation, a lot of it was that his body was afflicted. And sometimes it's your body that might get afflicted. Might be the tribulation that you go through that Yah allows you to go through, your health. But we know his children got killed, you know, the three, three daughters and his seven sons. They was doing birthday parties, all right? And we know that his stuff got taken away. And it was something that Yah allowed the devil to do to him for a test. All right, a Job and all of that did not did not accuse Yah falsely, did not slander his name, did not say anything bad about him. So God give us Yah, Yah will take it away. Blessed be the name of Yah. And that's what we got to do. Sometimes we can't really uh, hate the test that Yah allows. It ain't nothing gonna happen to you if Yah doesn't allow it. Believe. Me. And some of the tests that might be coming up on us is the stuff that we're bringing up on our own self. All right. Remember, keep yourselves from fornication, adultery, all of these sexual sins. All right. And from the things that the law says not to do, the commandment said not to do. Right? Keep yourselves from it. So, what happens is we participate in the works of the flesh, we're going to get a reward for it. And it's going to be not good. So we bring a lot of it up on our own self. So pray that Yah will give you strength, which is the power of the Holy Ghost, to resist temptation and not do what you're not supposed to do. And that's all of us. Um, praise Yah. Well, I pray that everybody's blessed and I hope that everybody's health is uh, intact. And if you're going through test and trial and tribulation, that you come through victoriously. All right. Praise Yah. And we'll see you next week, all right? Take it easy. Shalom.